So it is so exciting speaking to you tonight at this amazing event. I absolutely love girls right now, and I know what amazing work you do. So thank you, thank you for uh, asking me to be here. And I'm really excited to have done Pass the Pulse with these young writers. Have you ever done that, where you squeeze hands and the pulse goes around? It was very exciting. And you know, I was once a young writer too. That is true, just like you young ones. A long time ago, I was college roommates with Jane Austen. <laughs> and we used to read our work aloud to each other at night. And in her proper English accent, she would say, Meg, the most essential thing is that you be yourself when you sit down to write. And that turned out to be true, so thank you, Jane, for that. <laughs> but her advice raises an interesting question for me. How do you know who you are so that you know what to write about? People often say to writers this piece of advice, write what you know. Have people said that to some of you? Yeah. But I think it's a little bit different. I think actually it's the best advice is write what obsesses you, right? Write the thing that you're thinking about day and night. There's actually a way that we can all know that thing that we're thinking about, but we don't really want to do it. Here's what it is. Look at everything you've Googled for the past 24 hours, right? Wouldn't, that would be something. You really might not want to tell people what that is. For me, for me, it would be a kind of combination of Virginia Woolf and does this mole look suspicious? <laughs> Mentorship is a great way to jump into what you like. You can do it with a little help. Sometimes you don't entirely jump. Sometimes you're pushed by the other person. And I always love that moment during the Academy Awards that happens once in a while when some movie star thanks his or her teacher, right? And, and this sort of tight voice with emotion and the actor talks about how that teacher saw something in that person way back when and it made all the difference. And that kind of moment is really resonant and really emotional. The big star, you have to picture him or her as kind of young and vulnerable with the same face but like a really bad haircut, like a mullet or, you know, clear as sill on the skin or those, do you remember those lapels on shirts that were like as wide as an eagle's wing? Um, and the teacher is elderly now and maybe gone from the world. But I also respond to the idea that the connection between those two people made all the difference. And there's no way to prove it. Would the actor ever has d have done as well as he or she did without that kind woman in a cardigan sweater who directed the fifth grade production of The Crucible? We can't ever know. But I think what I love most is the simple connection between two people that the actor has articulated and how that moment lit a spark. I'm one of those people who feels very, very grateful to several different older people who I met when I was young because they helped light a spark in me. Early on in my life, I had a favorite teacher who invited me up to her desk in first grade the other kids were diligently filling out worksheets that commanded them in giant letters to color in the pumpkins orange. And above that sea of rapidly moving hands with orange crayons flying and mouths sort of open in concentration, tongues out, I sauntered up to Mrs. Gerby's desk and she told me that she had a feeling that I like to write stories. And I said, yes. And she said, well, Margaret, that's what I was back then. Well, Margaret, which partially explains why I love Judy Blume's Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret. And also, another book that I loved, of course, was A Wrinkle in Time. You remember Meg Murray? My books were made for me. What can I say? I'm like a narcissist. Um, so while everybody was crayoning in those pumpkins, Mrs. Gerby said, why don't you dictate stories to me, and I will write them down, because I can write them down a lot faster than you can. And I was sort of like an executive, and she was kind of my secretary. I was kind of like, take a letter, Mrs. Gerby. <laughs> strolling around. Um, from then on, whenever there was a moment of pumpkin coloring or triangle cutting, Mrs. Gerby summoned me, and together we amassed a big pile of short stories over the years, which my mother has saved to this day. Granted, none of them were good. I was seven. Um, my best one was about two truckers, this is true, and I don't, you think of me, you think of truckers, I don't know why, um, but the dialogue in this story went 
get up on the rig, Mac. I think I thought that was like the name for a man. I didn't know what a rig was. I knew it had to do with trucking, trucks. But I think that is how we all, everyone in this room, all writers begin. We approximate the world, right? Don't you write a little bit above what you know? I always do. I still do. And then you fill it in later. And I think that Mrs. Kirby gave me a chance. And it wasn't that she thought I was good. So it wasn't about achievement. It was that she saw that I liked it. And that is, I think, how sparks are lit. So years later, I reconnected with Mrs. Kirby when she came to a reading that I gave. And we were, by then, entirely different people. I was no longer Margaret. I was Meg. But she, apparently, from what she told me she wanted to be, was no longer Mrs. Kirby. She was, call me Ruth. It's like, who are you, lady? <laughs> call me Ruth. Um, and I got a little cocky. Hey, Ruthie, so many, you know. Um, we had graduated to different stages in our lives. She had retired. I was now a novelist. And for me, there was a little sadness in this fact. Um, I enjoyed getting a chance to tell her what she'd meant to me when I was very young. It wasn't an Academy Award speech. I didn't also get to thank the Academy. But I think she enjoyed hearing it, too. Um, when I think about thanking the Academy and talking about when you were young, I just want to completely off topic, but because I love it so much, just say one thing. I heard the greatest chant at a, a strike for the Writers Guild years ago. Um, these thinking about people who knew you back when you were young, like people you knew in high school, it went something like, what do we want for the people he, who knew us in high school to see how incredibly brilliant and successful we are? <laughs> when do we want it? Then. <laughs> but we usually don't get it then, do we? The encouragement of an older, esteemed person can be a gift. And I think like most gifts, the person who receives it is meant to use it any way she likes. If, like a child at Christmas, she wants to toss the gift aside and just play with the box, that should be OK, too. She shouldn't have to answer the question months later, where's that sweater I gave you, the one with the reindeers? I never see it. We live in a transactional world, one in which we're constantly signaling what we want from one another. But I think that a good mentor, and she may not even know she's fulfilling that role, has no expectations of what will become of the person she's encouraging. And in that freedom, invention sometimes begin and begins. And I think I want to just sort of say as a word of advice, not that any of you wonderful writers need that advice, when I was young, the one thing that I wish that I had done was felt more free. A little bit I was writing to what someone else's expectations were. You don't have to do that. And I don't think you are doing it, but just in case any of you thinks to do it, don't do that, really. Just be as free as you can. That's why we have revision, right? That's why God made revision. I had a number of mentors. My mother is one of them. Mrs. Gerby is one of them. The writer Nora Ephron was a wonderful mentor to me. but. I don't have a chance to thank any of them in person tonight. However, I do want to point out, um, I feel a little arrogant calling her a mentee, but a former student of mine who's here in the audience, Allison Fairbrother. Allison, can you stand up? This is Allison. Um, Allison is so great. And she had been in my writing workshop years ago in a, in a graduate writing workshop. And her own writing is terrific, and we're going to see, see that in the future. But years later, we stayed in touch, and I asked her if she would come help me um, with this book that has now become The Female Persuasion. Um, I, needed some, I needed to make sure I got some things right. I wanted Allison to be a researcher and a reader and an all-around incredibly helpful person, and it is to my great uh, happiness that she said yes. And she came in and sat with me in my apartment and got used to my super obsessive work habits the way that I would fret over every line. Basically, I would try to trick her into agreeing with me that something wasn't working <laughs> until I finally wore her down and she said yes. Um, but I learned from Allison my own strengths and my vulnerabilities. And it goes both ways, really. Um, it really does, this idea of mentorship. You know, we are lucky to work with 
our mentees. We absolutely are. Uh, Allison is now an editorial associate at the publisher that publishes me, Riverhead, and a lot of other people are lucky to work with her. So I want to take this moment to say thank you and say I am lucky to know you. So thank you, Allison. Um, so the novel, the novel that she helped me with, uh, the female persuasion. One of the themes of this book is mentorship and. Um, you know, basically, I wrote it just as a cunning way to get you to invite me to come here tonight. It was like a long way to go to do that, right? I had this other novel about whaling just because I wanted the whaling museum to invite me. It didn't happen. What a that was a waste. No, that's a joke. Um, <laughs> no novel about whaling. Sorry. This novel is about the person you might meet when you're young who ends up changing your life in a big way, and that's what happens to my protagonist, Greer Kadetsky. In 2006, she goes to college and she is groped at a frat party by a frat brother and she doesn't really understand, is she allowed to be really upset? What's happened? She doesn't really understand. And the famous feminist, Faith Frank, also a made up character, uh, comes to speak at the school. And Faith was famous back in the day, back in the 70s. And now she's on the college lecture circuit. She's in her 60s. And she comes and gives a speech and this is the moment when they meet. And I'm just going to read you a very, very tiny little bit in closing from, from that. So, at the podium, Faith Frank said, whenever I give a talk at colleges, I meet young women who say, I'm not a feminist, but, by which they mean, I don't call myself a feminist, but I want equal pay, and I want to have equal relationships with men, and I want to have a fair and good life. I don't want to be held back because I'm a woman. Later, Greer understood that what Faith had actually said in her speech was only one part of the whole effect. Really, it was about much more than her words. What also mattered was that it was her speaking them, meaning them, conveying them with such feeling to everyone in this room. And I always want to reply, said Faith, what do you think feminism is other than that? She stopped for a moment, and they all thought about this, some of them surely thinking about themselves. They watched her take a slow and deliberate drink of water, which was somehow, Greer realized, highly interesting. Sisterhood, Faith said, is about being together with other women in a cause that allows all women to make the individual choices they want. Because as long as women are separate from one another, organized around competition, like in a children's game where only one person gets to be the princess, then it will be the rare woman who is not, in the end, narrowed and limited by our society's idea of what a woman should be. Faith stopped again and looked out over the whole room, sweeping her gaze across them. So the next time you say, I'm not a feminist, remember all of this, and do what you can to join the fight, which is ongoing. She paused. Oh, and here's a final thought. Along the way, as you're fighting for what matters, you will definitely come up against resistance, and that can be upsetting and even throw you off course. The truth is that not everyone is going to agree with you. Not everyone is going to like you or love you. That's right, some people will be really mad at you and maybe even hate you, and that is going to be hard to accept. But my feeling is that if you're out there doing what matters, if it's any consolation at all, I love you. She smiled a brief, encouraging smile at them, and that was it. Greer folded. She was taken in completely, taken up, wanting more of this forever. Faith had made her little joke about loving them, but as Greer listened to Faith, what she herself felt seemed closely related to falling in love. Greer knew all about falling in love, the way discovering her boyfriend, Corey, had shaken her around and messed with her cells. This was like that, but without the physical feeling. Surely other people here felt it too, didn't they? And even if they'd been in a teenage stupor for years, staring at themselves in every reflective surface, frowning at their image as they popped a pimple with a little <laughs> splat of greenish milk against glass and railing to friends about their dumbass parents <laughs> or being forced to come to this chapel on this night despite being the kind of people Faith had described. Now a revelatory gong had been struck inside them. It vibrated and vibrated and it seemed like it would never stop. For here was this new, formidable person speaking in such an exciting way about their place in the looming, disturbing world, making them all want to be more than they were. Thank you. Um, thank you.